What does it mean to live together? On this land? In, in this, this place? place? Burnt Thicket Theatre presents We, we Treaty, Treaty People. People. Audio dramas exploring what it means to embrace all our relations. Welcome back for our conversation with the artists from last episode. Remnants. My name is Yvette Nolan, and I'm the production dramaturge for We Treaty People. My name is Stephen Walchmidt. I'm the artistic director of Burnt Thicket Theatre. Part of my personal journey in recent years has been about learning to see the history of Canada from Indigenous perspectives and unlearning cultural assumptions and practices I've received in my Eurocentric heritage. Of course, this learning and unlearning are ongoing. As a company, Burnt Thicket is seeking to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 83 to support good ways for Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists to collaborate in making theatre that contributes to reconciliation in these lands called Canada. In our live shows after Curtain Call, we encourage audiences and artists to engage with each other, with the story, and with their real lives outside the theatre. Given that these are digital performances, we hope this conversation with the artists will expand your reflection about the play. We'd like to invite you to learn more. Check out the resources and suggestions in the episode description and our website. We encourage you to talk about the play with your friends, to chat with us on Facebook or in our virtual talkbacks on Zoom. Or by leaving a response on our website. We want to hear what you think. And now, recorded on Treaty 6 territory, we bring you a conversation with the artists from Remnants. I'll just start and say I'm really excited to to be sitting here with the creative team for Remnants by Curtis Petitus. And first I'll just invite you to go around and introduce yourself and what role you play. Hello, my name is Joshua Beaudry and I play Merrick Soap and Elder Fogey. Hey everybody, I'm Denny Knight and I directed uh, Remnants. I am Curtis Petitus, I am the playwright for Remnants. Carol Grey Eyes, and um, I'm the envoy as well as the dramaturge Ooh. on this project. Right, I'm Sean Cuthand, and I play uh, Lady Hula and the Almighty Zed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Christina Hughes, and I played Commander Trem Lylan. I'm Tim Bratton, and I was recording and sound design. So before, uh, before I invite you to to chime in on this one, we want to ask a question for our listeners to take a moment and reflect on. So if you're listening from home, what surprised you as you experienced remnants? Or is there a line or an image from the play that is sticking with you now? I think uh, what surprised me the most is just the approach to the uh, the content, the uh, the science fiction sort of approach. I was really excited about, and uh, it was a great, insightful way of looking into treaty issues. Yeah, there's something about being in space, but participating in the same story that we're living here in Canada, that really makes you feel how lonely it is to try and reconcile when you don't really know the way forward, when there's a path set out in front of you that you're not really sure on how to, how to, how to, how to tread. And, and looking at the words and feeling the, the loneliness of Commander Trim really gave me a different perspective of looking at treaty through the eyes of non-status people. And it's a really strong play I can't, I can't escape the thought of seeing Earth floating in space, and that sticks with me. I think some of the story, for me, can be kind of a 
scary in a way because like if you're looking at it it's like like the futuristic sci-fi story and they're still not getting it you know so like it's kind of like dark for us to look at now and think like oh we're not gonna get it to like the future when we're in space you know (laughs) (laughs) that kind of like freaks me out you know and uh yeah yeah, almost like yeah a bit dreary just to think like in the future they're not even getting it in the past we didn't get it now we're not getting it when do we get it (laughs) i feel the the image that sticks with me is like the vastness of space and the loneliness of floating. But one of the themes that for me is very prominent is this sense like that you only know what you know until you know something different. And you know, like Trem just operates on the basis of what she has always been taught and the sort of system that she's been upholding until she knows different. Um, unfortunately for Trem and the rest of the members aboard the domicile, it's too late. And that's where that loneliness and the vastness of the vast emptiness resonates for me. I think there's something about it too, about just from my white perspective of removing the immediacy of it, like setting it in the future with different people. We don't know who they are. We don't know the perspective. And so like, say if you never wanted to touch treaty issues in your life, you just didn't, you don't care. Or the idea of talking about it turns you off. Like you're offended by it. I, what I appreciate about this is that it allows a window into that without feeling like something you're, you're about to learn a lesson. Maybe it happens more subtly because now you can, you get to decide where you fit into this story. Maybe that doesn't make sense. That makes sense. Okay. I really enjoy the, the way Curtis wrote this one. Because whenever we speak about treaty or whenever you see it, it's all, it always feels like a, like a like lecture or like it's a lesson. It's so loaded. Yeah. yeah. And, and the way Curtis has, has, has written it, it's not. It's just flowing, and you're going with you're going. You're like in the spaceship, flowing with the with the information, but you're also really, really, really paying attention to the characters that are there. And there's like comedy, and and there and there's fear. There's all this stuff that really like helps you intake what the subtext is, which is the treaty, and where you wouldn't normally be maybe open to that. All of a sudden, it's like it's an interesting because it, it's it makes it a story. Yeah, yeah. and. Yeah. Gives you some distance. Yeah. So you can yeah. see it. Yeah. Plus it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Plus it's funny. Yeah. That's a great segue, actually, because I wanted to ask you, Curtis, would you share a little bit about what inspired you in writing this play? Sure. It actually started off as a radio show, right? You see that with Commander Trem. And I wrote a first draft, gave it that first treatment. I really liked what I had written. And then my friggin' MacBook crashed. Yeah. Oh, I lost it. Oh, oh no! So I panicked, and he and uh, Stephen kept getting a hold of me. What's how's it going? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I give him a thumbs up, and here I'm panicking. I need a MacBook computer. Oh, yeah. I finally got one. I rang off a draft based on what I could remember. But the thing about it was, when we talk about things like treaty, within those events in our history there are always messages we need to we should we should heed we should acknowledge be aware of and when we have those messages we never ever get to see what happens if we don't Mm. so finally i thought let's just see what happens if we don't if we didn't do anything at all listen to anything in the world where would we be and i thought gosh that's pretty depressing (laughs) (laughs) i want to take it somewhere where distance i want to create distance i want it to happen somewhere either on a boat in another universe and this time i went to space 
I've recently took, taken my writing to that kind of dystopian science fiction, and I really enjoyed working with Carol because this is my third script in alter universes, right? And so Carol's been there on that journey, and I think she's provided a lot of really great insight in shaping this particular script. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, here's a question that is maybe a little bit different angle. Some of you have read it. But we were curious to hear how you would describe, maybe how are you connected to the land and to communities around where you live? For me, there's this sort of nostalgia or sentimentality of being connected to the land through the generations of my relatives that came here and survived. But I think that's like a nostalgia more than anything else. The way that makes me feel truly connected to the land is when I interact with it. So when I go out... Um, maybe on a hike and I am surrounded by it, that's where I feel the most profound connection to this land and all that it has to offer me. Um, Cause I, when you take yourself outside of that sort of city atmosphere where you feel like part of the city and put yourself in just like wild nature, that's when I start to understand that I am part of that. I'm not separate and inside of it I am I am one with it and that starts to help me feel less <laughs> like existential dread we'll say because it's bigger than me and I'm just one small part of it it gives me comfort it's a huge question man mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yvette Nolan oh of course suggested this one she always <laughs> this just the biggest questions ever made <laughs> Kind of vibe on what Christina was saying about being nostalgia and stuff like that. After being like it was the year beginning of year three of the pandemic, we have all pretty much really been in isolation in our own kind of pods in reflection to this. And uh, like the connection to the community, it's almost been like it's been taken away, right? You know what I mean? But there are moments that you find where you can find peace when you are on the land. And Christina says she goes on a hike. It's always really funny, the first like six hours of being out in the wilderness camping or at a ceremony, how foreign the land feels to you because you're so used to being in the city. You're so used to having your roof. You're so used to knowing all the sounds. But there's something about like the silence that you hear out in nature. You know what I mean? You don't hear the constant hum of lights. You don't hear the constant hum of cars. Everything becomes so quiet that the quietest sounds become really amplified and you really hear everything that's around you. I think about this time when I was, I was out in Nipawin, I was staying in this cabin and it was on a bee farm. It was really cool. And I remember like, and like the, the bee farm was intertwined with some of the cabins. It's like their touristy spot. But I remember laying down, falling, trying to fall asleep. And it was just silent, like, you know what I mean? Like, it was just so quiet, I could hear, I could hear, like, the dog snoring that's in, like, that's, like, 50 meters away from me inside their house. You could hear it. And then I, I started to hear this low hum. And it kind of sounded like buzzing. And I was like, oh, crap, are the bees waking up? <laughs> and I was very scared, right? And then, uh, and then I realized it was just a plane as it got closer. Mm -hmm. But that moment really, 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 really spoke to me on how, like, what's the right word? It's just, it's, 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 it, they're really two different worlds. And the, and, and the, the fact that I was scared of bees, but it came to a plane, but it was a plane. It showed me that I was, I was so disconnected from, from the land by living in the city that the city began to scare me when I was on the land. 
I think for me, I've always felt like a foreigner in this territory. Going to schools, going to hospitals, walking into stores, public places, I've always felt like a stranger. And the thing is, this is my homeland, mm-hmm. you know? So, and it was that disconnection to my culture, language, and identity that had me feel like I was a stranger here, wherever I would go. I always felt that way. Then when I started to connect, and it was through theater, the cultural arts, to that culture, that identity, I started to realize, you know, I need to create my own cognizance, if you will, of my place in my in this space, right? And to say, you know what, this has been home for generations for Indigenous people. And now, today, I do actually walk with a little bit more confidence in the world knowing that. So it's really helped me on my personal healing journey too. There's one part of the play... It kind of like reminded me of like, kind of like elementary school, like the acknowledgement and how they talk about the acknowledgement and and uh, when she goes through through it all, it, it kind of like gave me that vibe of like, of like doing the national anthem and and the Lord's prayer in school, you know, and like for me, like when I grew up in uh, I grew up in Confed Park, and uh, in the nineties. <laughs> And so I recently like went went back to that school, and they are now like a Cree school, and they have like treaty flags and Métis flags, and that stuff wasn't around when I was a kid there, and it made me feel like things could definitely have been different if I grew up knowing that that was accepted, and yeah, so that that just kind of like. It shows me how much things are changing nowadays. It's neat that this is kind of like we're talking about treaties, but our play was in space. Like two different <laughs> things are going on yeah. there, and it's it, it makes the talk maybe a little bit easier to enter into mm-hmm. as well. Uh-huh. But there's a lot of fun to be had. Like the great thing about being a playwright is is watching or hearing your play, in this case, come to life. It was so much fun. And there was a comment earlier that this play also is and carries some humor. I would be just holding my mouth, both my hands to my mouth, trying not to laugh because I know it gets serious later. (laughs) Dude, we did have to take a break. (laughs) Yeah, Christina and Josh couldn't get it together. We had to stop. Tried like three takes and then just giggles. <laughs> Maybe a blooper episode. It's all on tape. Well, related to that question about the land, um, you could still talk about yeah, how are you connected to the land, to the communities around you, but also how would you like to grow to be more connected? For me as a writer, actually going further away from the land. Mm. This is a play that I wrote away from Earth and earthly places. It was on a dying little space station, right? And so that entering with that background made me go, okay, where can I insert connection to land, spirituality, uh, you know, even the medicines we use? I, I was going like this, oh boy, okay, I've really put myself in a corner here. And that is actually what has really helped me as a writer is is taking what I know, putting in worlds that I know nothing about. That has been a lot of fun. Um, I think like I like to try and um, connect to the land when I go up north. Um, like I go up to like Weaquin Lake and Larange area, and like that's where my uh, grandpa raised his family. Like he was born on Little Pine First Nation, but then. He raised his family up in Little Pine. And when I drive from like PA to LaRange, that only takes like less than three hours. But my grandpa had to walk from LaRange to PA before there was a road, and that took like four days. <laughs> and like that just puts, I, I t- puts so much things into perspective. And like you just look at how vast the forests are up there and, and just uh, like the lots of land up there that's just like a lot it can seem like it's untouched even and so yeah that's just like that's kind of like my um solace in saskatchewan <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. 
coincidentally, um, right after this, I'm going to vote Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, which is my nation. We're voting on um, ratification of basically land back. And this, uh, just right around the turn of the century, land was taken land that we had signed for in the treaty that belonged to us that was taken away and it's taken a long long time but we're um, right after this I'm going to go and, and put my ex <laughs> to get our land back and I know that for for my family like and for all of the people of, of Muskeg that taking that land from us was a huge mm, wound. Mm -hmm. It was a big wound. And it's, you know, it's going to take a long time to heal it. But this is uh, one step. And I think it has to do with, for me, just a sense of I'm allowed to be here. Mm -hmm. Because when I grew up, there was no sense of being allowed to be here. This is a great disruption that happened. And, um, you know, when I hear things about we won't have second-class citizens, and, you know, we didn't even have the right to vote, and we couldn't leave. We were, we were kept in prison in the module, <laughs> like on the reserve module. And yeah. um, we weren't allowed, we couldn't have lawyers. We, you know, there were so many rights that we didn't have that I think psychologically and emotionally that was all kind of passed on. So we couldn't take up space. And I, I feel like in this play, I could be wrong, Curtis, but I feel like it's just elbows out. It's like, no, enough. You know, when, when um, Zed says stop, like, it's over. We're, we're mad as hell and we're not gonna take it anymore. Mm. Yeah. And I think for, I mean, that's, that's a release, I think for a lot of us. <laughs> it's kind of a psychological, it's like, no, damn it, we're allowed to be here. We're allowed to be here. What, an, what a concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a concept. Because I know that I don't have that. I, you know, you're always kind of a second-class citizen. citizen. You, don't have, you don't have rights. Some people do. Some people are the warriors, and they're right out there, and... Um, but no, you just step back and you're silenced. That's why I think this play is, um, it's, it's a, it's a really good start. I think psychologically and emotionally to go, no, wait a minute. <laughs> no, enough. We, there's been enough here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're just going to take it. It doesn't necessarily have to be violent and it, it doesn't have to be at the, at the cost of the destruction of, of everybody, because in this case, it was extreme. There were no winners in this, yeah. you know. Uh, the, the Abgens lost their space station, but they, they, it was a desperate act, and they, they felt that they had to do it. So, yeah. I mean, in terms of connection to land, yeah, that's, to me, it's, a, it's more of a psychological, emotional, I guess intellectual yeah. understanding of, of, yeah, I'm, I'm actually allowed to be here. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, that's the physical reality of having land restored. Yeah. Hopefully we'll restore spiritual, emotional realities and
for, for future generations as well? Well, we won't get it back. The, ah. the land that was taken is gone. Okay. It, we won't get it back, but we're, we'll get compensation. Compensation, I see. I you see. know, yeah. we'll get compensated. <laughs> it, it's not quite the same thing, but right. it's something. But it's, yeah. it's, it's a step. And having the right to, to take up space. Yeah. Each, everyone needs to... Yeah, like needs to know that they that there's room for them, right? There's, yeah. there's room for everyone. Well, know. like Zed says, this was our place in space. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. our place in space. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a heavy question too. Yeah, like how can you increase your connection to the land? It's like just by, just like jumping off what Carol said and what like the. If we ever, even when we get compensated, it's, it will never be the same. Like, you can get the money, you could buy some land to increase your connection to the land, like, really physically, but then you're still, but then you're buying into the colonial system to get the land back, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's not, it's not a true act of having the land back. And for me, like... Speaking of connection to the land, it's all about just being there and being comfortable and taking what you can from those moments that you have. And as we delve further into this climate crisis, the less time we have with the land in this in its state where it is hospitable, because it's not going to be, and it's really... If you wanted to have a greater connection to the land, we'd put a full stop on everything. But that's the sad reality yeah. of where we're at. Mm -hmm. So you just got to cherish what you have for how long, as long as you have it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And th this this script is, in some ways, a warning, <laughs> yeah. and a and a call to. I, I keep reading and hearing. We need the political will to do what we know we need to do about. The environment, and yeah, let's do it. Yeah. We almost need more than the political will because yeah. I think we have the political will. We don't have the politicians to make it happen. <laughs> Some reason they're not receiving the message. It's almost like <clears throat> the struggle of having land back isn't an indigenous struggle, and it's and it's not the government anymore, right? It's all of us. And it's the corporations, it's the politicians. I have this thing that I say that you better watch out because they're going to treat you too now. Mm. You know, and you look at companies like Nestle, mm -hmm. you look at people like Scott Moe, and who they, who they side with when it comes to our future and the people. And, it, and if, you wanted to, in, in, if you wanted to, in my mind, increase your connection to the land, we take away that their power to take for yeah. uh, that they have a rest to take it away from us. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, Danny. Going back to the land question because I've never thought of it before, uh, and like I've been fairly transient in my life. I move around, I move around a lot, particularly when I was younger. This is the longest I've lived in any place, and so I never <laughs> considered my my. Uh, connection to the land until I asked, I was asked this question and um, I couldn't even think of it was my connection and then I was like well the closest is that my father-in-law's got a art studio outside of town and uh, about 20 years ago I planted a copse of trees there <laughs> and you know then I hit then about a decade went by where I just did go by the studio and then I went there and then all of a sudden I saw all, all, everything I had done <laughs> It's, it's transformed the, what it looked like. And uh, so I guess that that was the most connection I had to the land. And uh, and even a sense of community. I have, a, I, I've, I have periodically a sense of community because any time I participate in a show, I have the community of people I work with. And sometimes the community of artists, but I'm fairly... I like isolation. I like being 
by myself or with my family. And so I can also sever ties with my community and just go and be a hermit and enjoy that. And I think the only way of increasing my relationship with the land or, um, I, yeah, is like, obviously kind of what we're talking about is taking care of it. Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, when the pandemic hit, uh, Angela and I would just go around with garbage bags and pick up all the garbage around the streets in our community. And like, I guess that's sort of like a relationship with the land. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Caring for it in a way, a small thing, but, yeah. and then like two days later, there are so many Tim Hortons cops, like all along the road again, mm. <laughs> didn't take very long. <laughs> to, but yeah. yeah, so it's an ongoing relationship. Mm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. In my home, I, I'm like you, I, I kind of have enjoyed being, becoming more of a <laughs> hermit in the yeah, last couple of years. I do love that. But one of the ways that in my small little life, I can kind of connect the land where I'm at is um, because I love to garden and grow food. And I've been gradually like taking out all of the grass in my yard and replacing it with things like like the the flowers the brightly colored flowers the pollinators really like to attract all the the bees and the butterflies bees eating grass is terrible <laughs> for the environment so um and growing food brings me so much joy like when the strawberries come in season and then my strawberries give me strawberries i feel like I feel like they have decided to give me a gift. And I don't see it like, I did this. I see it like I nurtured you and I provided for you. And in return, you gave me your gifts. And I don't know, it's, it's very like, <laughs> it's a very romantic way of seeing it. But I just feel like, again, we're the same, the land and I. And like, Danny, when you were saying like being out in, you know, the forest or whatever, everything goes on around you exclusive, like, of you. The birds don't care that you are there. They continue on their business. You know what I mean? Like, y you're no longer the main character in your own story. And that makes me feel, again, like I said, comforted. Because sometimes that pressure of being in charge of your own life is, uh, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I'd rather just be like in the in the sort of soft cradle of 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 nature, where my life is actually in, in, insignificant. Mm. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, does a tree? If a tree falls in the forest, <laughs> right? If it make, does it make a sound? It doesn't matter. It does matter. <laughs> Not for us, anyway. Yeah. Still good, life will still go on. Yeah. 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 We have just a few more minutes. One more question. How has telling this story affected the ways you see other people? Or maybe how the phrase, all my relations, <laughs> resonates with you? We've been talking about these, but I... I for me, hearing this play come to life has fascinated me with the characters. So I see these characters as either the first explorers, the first settlers, or the first indigenous people. And I go, wow. What that does for me now is makes me want to answer questions. Who is Commander Trem Lylan? You know, who are these Abgen people we're talking about in this world of remnants? And I actually have drafted six more short plays based out of this one. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> there is Residuum, Reliquary, Reside, Repose, Resolve. Wow. And so one of them is, so for example, I wanted to know what happened when they first, when the first takeover happened. So I wrote a two-page script of... Trem busting into the main flight deck with this armor on, shiny armor Check covered out. in blood, right? Whoa. And you hear voices, you hear death, you hear screaming and all of that. But 
what we go to is we hear all the voices in Trem's head so we know where Trem's coming from. So there's a partner, there's mm. a child. <gasps> And I was thinking the first explorers didn't just come here. They left something behind mm -hmm. too, right? So that's where manifest destiny for me in this world, you know, I don't know if it matters or not, but for me, it's a mechanical planet made of technology and software. That's mm -hmm. what manifest destiny is. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, that's going to just die out. That's why everyone's going somewhere to look for habitable space mm -hmm. so i've taken it way beyond the, <laughs> the answer of your question but this has excited me so much mm -hmm. and and it's just the storytelling has come so naturally again based on what i know but planting it in other worlds i know nothing about it's yeah. exciting mm -hmm. cool. freaking so cool I totally forgot the question after listening to that. <laughs> so yeah, how, how is being part of telling this story affecting how you see other people or how you see the phrase, all my relations? Okay, yeah. So, uh, one really cool thing about this play and about the state of the world that we live in, and then Curtis confirmed it, is like, this is like a warning. Right? What, if, what if we didn't listen, right? You know what I mean? So even as a person who, like I'll just as an example for current everyday life, even as a person who doesn't understand or respect anything about this convoy that went across Canada, you know what I mean? Um, I did see we, we we saw we saw parallels and we saw and we saw differences in how the Canadian government treated them, right? When we had our protesters at at, at Wet'suwet'en, there were snipers, right? With this trucker convoy, they shut down Ottawa for two weeks before anyone ever showed up. Three weeks, sorry, yeah, for anyone ever showed up, right? And that just really bothered me, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But what bothered me more, or what bothers me more, is uh, is how, like, we are just, in the same way that those convoy people let uh, the Wet'suwet'en people issue just go under the rug, and dismiss them for whatever reasons. I am. I find myself doing the same thing to this trucker convoy, finding reasons to dismiss them, finding reasons not to care about them. Well, the government freezes their bank accounts. The government forces them. Like the the, the dude stepped down and said, "I don't want to do any of this anymore. I'm all done because over the threat of jail." Right? You know what I mean? And all they really want is to have their life back. And that's all we really want, but they don't understand the difference that we can't because of this virus. But because they don't understand and they're stupidly doing this tantrum, they're being severely, severely punished by the Canadian government in the same way that Indigenous people are being punished, right? Mm -hmm. And here we are. And I think of that, that, that quote, you know, when they came for the Jews uh, or whatever. Yeah. Who, what's the quote? Who said that? But that quote, was when they, it only mattered when they came for me, mm -hmm. right? And then... And, it, and, it, and it's just, it's shaking me to my core, thinking about all my relations, about everybody's supposed to be my brother, and even these trucker convoys are supposed to be my brother. And here we are, letting the Canadian government just bulldoze them. I know they shouldn't be there, and they shouldn't be doing this, there, there should be other ways to do it, but they're bullying them out, right? In the same way that they bullied us. And you, and... Like, there's argument to be like, well, we don't have to stand up for them because they didn't stand up for us. But we, but if you want to move forward, you want to be a good person, you have to be a better and bigger person, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just, you can't tell them to, sorry for swearing, you can't tell them to fuck off because they told you to fuck off if you think you're a better person. Mm -hmm. So that's what this place really opened my eyes about. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. if I can jump off that, what you said, Danny. I, like, I think part of what I hope for myself going forward, and I think this ties in with what Chris wrote is this sense of like, am am I a person who engages with others with the the intention to coercively convince them or make them what I want, which is what you see the way it's framed of like when Zed says it's like, well, you didn't listen. We told you you didn't listen. Is that how I engage, or am I someone who's actually going to listen mm. and and find spaces where I I hear people who are different, people who have wisdom that I need people who I disagree with. Is, is my fundamental posture one of coercion and getting my way, or is it one of, of listening and hearing the things that often um, aren't heard and need to be heard? Mm. We have different takeaways too, because I look at uh, 
I look at all the politicians stepping forward and, and pointing fingers and saying we need to be listening. Um, conveniently saying that now when it's their voter base, <laughs> but not when, you know, Tristan de Roger yeah. walked 600 kilometers and they never even spoke to him. And then the, the malice that they had towards the prime minister for not daring to speak to the convoy you know, like how they could have the audacity to say that when they were too cowardly to go out and talk to a young man who's defending the people in his community. They weren't trying to topple Mo's government like they're trying to get Trudeau out of there. So, yeah. But, I, but I, I did try and watch them getting ousted yesterday and think these are people, you know, and not all of them want that. So, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Different perspective. I really struggle with that idea. If we think about all my relations, if I think about my relations being, let's say, the white population, I find it very challenging because I <laughs> have a lot of racist uncles out there, if really that's all my relations, and I can't debate with them all. And at the end of the day, people only change if they want to. And I have participated in so many really wonderful conversations with my community artists and like-minded folks. And I just wish sometimes like plays like this and talkbacks like this were listened to by the people who really need them. It, you know, like took me a long time to get to where I am. You know, I was not always someone who understood the way that I do now. And I acknowledge that. Probably 20 years it took me to, like, really get to where I am today. And that's a long time. <laughs> so, I don't know. I really struggle. I really struggle with that one. Um, I'm a classic, like, overthinker. It's... Just the old anxiety disorder, no big deal, nothing to see here. But um, I honestly feel responsible. Like I feel the weight of reconciliation on my shoulders every day. Um, so then when I see convoys going out and I see, you know, the, that they shut down Ottawa for three weeks, but that's so different from any time of, there's ever been an indigenous protest. I just think like, is everybody else like, we all know what's happening here, right? Like we're all looking at the same thing here. So I find it really upsetting, but since I can't change everybody's mind, I go about my life making small changes wherever I can. Um, in my job, I try to, um, do my best um, to live reconciliation as I understand it. Um, that's, for me, I think the only, that's where I'm at today, I guess. Yeah, I think of the water defenders, you know, like yeah. when Trump, during Trump's election, just after mm -hmm. he won, and he was like, go and get them out of there, and they're hitting them with water cannons yeah. and rubber bullets, yeah. and then saying that they were attacking the police, but like, you couldn't see any footage. And uh, during the G7, when they were just like randomly pulling up and snatching people off the streets and throwing them in the town marked police vehicles and driving them off, they might not have been doing anything but walking down the street. I look at all that compared to what's happening and how like docile they were with the people yesterday, and I don't think it's even. No, it's not. I don't know. I think small, small steps, like you were saying, that's what Dr. Bader Ginsburg says. Oh yeah, well, just small steps, and and this play, this whole idea put on by non-indigenous theater company, and bringing us all together, because we're we're now a community, we're a circle, we're a tribe, you know, we're a a, a very strong circle now. And we're made up of people from different perspectives, different age generations, 
different histories, different experiences, but we were able to come together and produce this lovely piece of art and everybody contributed um, to make to make this circle strong and I think it's going to have impact. It, it has impact for me, it has impact for every person. We're going to go out and we're going to make changes because our minds have been changed as a result of this process. And, and at the end, I, you know, it comes down to uh, we, we've learned to love each other. And um, we're going to spread that because we love, we love what we're doing. I think it's going to have a knock-on effect. I hope it does. It might not be dramatic as a convoy or blowing up something, but I have hope that we're not going to end up in space. <laughs> you know? That's good because it actually scares me to be in space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Well, it's yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the warning. Yeah. Act before it's too late. And I ultimately, I think you're right. You know, like, <laughs> ultimately you're right because, like, we aren't going to solve any problems by, like, constantly, you know, uh, shutting other people out because we disagree with them. Mm -hmm. We probably work towards it by listening and finding what we do, where do we have common ground. Yeah. Before, before the ALNs. Come yeah. take us Come, away. Yeah. <laughs> well, not you, but me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, See you later, sucker. <laughs> Trim and foamy will just be snuggling. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to cut off the conversation because it's so good. And so, if anyone has any last thing they want to share, please do. But I also want to just, <clears throat> just respect or be cog, give cognizance to everyone. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Carol's got to go vote. I got to go vote. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got to do vote. my thing. I'll just. Uh, Which I'll is oh. all all part of the colonizers game, but yeah. whatever. Yeah, got to do what you got to do. Yeah. yeah. So I want to say thanks to Curtis for writing this. Thanks to Stephen yeah. for prodding Curtis to write this. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for Carol for being so. Carol. Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Like this is one moment you're this whimsical, ha ha. Other moments you're this you're this ma major think tank, you know. So I appreciate all the wealth of knowledge you bring, and thanks to all the cast cast for saying yes when I asked you guys. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Tim for all his really really great. He made some really wonderful music and sound effects for this, and thank you to the listeners. We Treaty People is a production of Burnt Thicket Theatre. Support our work with a donation and learn more about the artists at burntthicket.com. And check out our website or the episode description for links to other great learning resources. Special thanks go to the Canada Council for making this project possible. And to our season sponsors, Shercom Industries and SK Arts. This work was gratefully created on Treaty 6 territory and on the homeland of the Métis. Join us next time for another audio drama episode of We Treaty People.